every once in a while you have a day stand out to you as something that was special, that something that that really struck you and, and something you'll never forget. Some of these days are expected, like the day that I went on my first date with my wife, or the days that my children were born. But some of them are unexpected. I'm going to tell a story about one of those days that was unexpected. This is the trip to Normaby Island. this day so special was that it was part of a trip that we had to Papua New Guinea in the summer of 2019. I was part of a three-person team from Michigan. Uh, we were part of the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America and we are partnered with the Lutheran Church in Papua New Guinea. And so we had a two-week trip over there. Now it's not easy to get to Papua New Guinea. First, we had to fly across the United States, which I'm fairly used to. Having family in California, we usually fly to California a few times a year. But then after doing that long day flight, we had to hop on another plane to go on an overnight flight to Australia. Then we had a day or two in Australia to get used to the time zone change. And we had another flight up to uh, Port Moresby. Now we spent some time in Port Moresby, which is the capital city of Papua New Guinea. And that's a big city, it has a few million people living there. After settling in, in, in Port Moresby, they decided that they wanted, really wanted us to visit Alotau, which is in Milne Bay, which is on the far eastern edge of, of Papua New Guinea. Our host in Port Moresby said, you know, if they tell you let's go to the point, go ahead, go to the point. It's, a, it's very beautiful there. Uh, let them take you there and, and have a great time. But I would caution against going out to the islands. The islands there are, the, the seas are really rough at this time of year. And so you might not want to do that. And we're like, sure, that's fine. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll take that ad, ad, advice and, and let's go. Of course, we flew then to Alotau, which Alotau, there's no roads to get there. You have to either take a flight or a boat. So we flew. And we landed and we met our hosts in Alotau and we collected our bags and one of the first things they said to us is like, we're so glad you're here and tomorrow we're going to take you out to the island so you can see the islands as well. And we decided, you know what, there's no use in fighting it. <laughs> if they say it's okay, it's okay, let's go. So, so it was great in, in that they were so welcoming there. Uh, we spent the rest of the day with them, but the next morning we were headed out to, to the island. Now because the seas are so rough at this time of year, they decided that it would be best to leave early. And we agreed, so we decided to get up and, and be on the road at 5. We got pa packed up for the day out. We weren't really sure what to take with us because we really weren't sure what the day would bring. But we did our best and each of us had bags and we, we headed out for the hour and a half drive to get from Alotau over to the East Point. Today we're going to the islands over there. And we're gonna travel in these boats here. And it's gonna be an adventure. <laughs> what we got, food and water and load it all up and then I think it's they said it takes about 45 minutes to an hour to take the boat over to the island uh, and there we will uh, see a new uh, uh, the, the congregation here in Alatao has a has a mission um, they have uh, mission churches uh, over uh, four different places on the island we're going to the, just to the closest one because uh, the other ones are on the other side of the island so uh, but it should be good it should be it should be fun uh, get out in the open water a little bit so here we go
Now, we had reached the shoreline of the village, but there wasn't really a lot there. And so we were kind of apprehensive. We were still trying to figure out what was going on here. And we were informed that we actually had to hike in a ways. Finally, we came to a clearing where we could kind of see what was hap what was where we were going. And there was this fenced off area that had a rope fence, but then along the rope, they had tied hundreds, maybe thousands of flowers. And I knew then that our the flowers could only have been for our visit because when you tie these flower, when you pick these flowers from the trees that they come from, they only last for about a day before they start to wilt, and these were fresh. Now, after the Sing Sing performance was over, everybody kind of gathered around and, and we actually met at, at the church for the village. Now, this church took them five years to build. And this, the, it was an open air church. It only had corners and, and, and uh, beams along the sides and a roof on top. There was no walls. But we came in this area and each of us took some time to, to tell everybody about ourselves. And there was just a big group of people around us, that from the kids sitting down in the front, uh, a little bit older behind them, and the adults all the way to, to uh, the elders. And everybody was gathered to, to, just to hear what we had to say about our lives back home. And we spent a lot of time asking questions about their lives there so that we could learn what, what their life was day to day. And it was just a fantastic way for us to talk to each other um, and, and really learn about, about how things are different in, in each of our parts of the world. Now, I, I remember talking to one gentleman there. His name was Willie. And he was telling me about how his faith was ebbed and flowed and he went uh, left the church for a long time and they came back and he just never was very consistent but there was one time that he came back and they invited him they put him in charge of the youth and he did that and he never looked back and he's always he's he's stayed there ever since and i it really struck a chord with me because I shared that my faith does the same thing. There's times that I'm really involved with the church and other times where I'm not. And you could see the look on his face. If I could have captured that, it would have been amazing. But he had the biggest smile knowing that even though we were such different people, we still had the same issue in common, that we still experience uh, thing, something in the same way. So after we were talking a little while, they gave us a tour of the village. And we didn't see the whole thing, of course, but the part that we saw was pretty amazing. So first we came to this, this little water hut. Now, this water hut was actually, since there wasn't any kind of wells or electricity or anything in this village, um, they needed a source for water. There was a river that came through. And for this water hut, they had a hose go up to either, like, either to the river or to a local spring, and they just had a constant stream of water going through this building. And they would use it to, to wash, uh, and they would use it to cook. And it would just be a constant source of fresh water for the people there. 
Now, then we kept on going. We walked uh, through this pathway through the jungle, and there really was a, quite a distance between when we left that one area and went to the next, and there was a school there. And their school was basically, they had a, a lawn in the middle, and then around the outside, around three sides, there were buildings. And these buildings did have walls and, and so forth, and they were a little bit more modern um, with uh, uh, metal roofs and so forth. But, but they didn't have windows, like the windows were still just cut out and, and open air in that respect. But they had a, a good sized school. Now across the path from the school, there was a soccer field. And we didn't go to any villages while we were there that didn't have a soccer field. It's such a big sport in that area. Um, this one was kind of unique though, I'll never forget. The goalposts weren't really goalposts. They were just kind of makeshift goalposts. And it just, it, it occurred to me, it's like, you know what, that will work, you know, it'll work as a, as a field, it'll work as a goal, but it wasn't like uh, the typical goal poles that, that you're used to seeing on a soccer field. Now, the other thing I talked to them about was, was what kind of interaction they had with other people on the island. Now, this village, like, was, was kind of on its own, and, but there were other villages that we saw along, along the bay on our way in. And so I asked them about that. And it turns out they do trade between the villages, but it's not as often as you would think. It's not like a, uh, uh, even once a week that people would travel between villages. There's no real way even like horses or anything that would speed up traveling between these villages. They're just, everybody is just on foot. So it would take a good portion of a day to walk to the next village. And if you wanted to walk to the other side of the island, it would, it would take all day or, or multiple days. And so it really, uh, and, and that's because the island was, was, was more like a long and thin island, but to cross the short path would take you at least a day's walk to get there. And so there wasn't a whole lot of foot traffic on the on the island. It was more if you're doing something, you would have boats go from villages to the mainland, like I saw in at the East Point uh, before we got on the boat. And so that was just kind of fascinating to me how you could live so remotely from the world on an island in the middle of the Pacific and that your interaction is almost entirely within your own village and, and not with the outside world. And then I imagine that it's probably not very often that they get visitors like the three of us from Michigan uh, that would come to their village just to, to be there and, and be with them. Um, and so it was kind of uh, a, neat, a neat thing to, to kind of get, um, get the chance to do this because I, I could tell it wasn't something that happened very often. Later on, I was talking to somebody uh, who, was, who lived in Alotau, and they said that they had never brought anybody over there. We were the first ones, and so that made it the day even more special. When it was finally time for us to take off, we went down to the shoreline to get in the boats, and a lot of the villagers came to, to wish us well and, and say their farewells there. Uh, we waded into the water and got in the boat. Uh, so we took off and almost immediately you could notice a difference in, in the, the waves and stuff even when we were still in the bay, in, in Siwa Bay. And I thought, gosh, if this is any indication of what it's like uh, on the open water, this is going to be bad. And sure enough, as soon as we got out of the bay, the, the waves just kind of hit us. The skipper did a really nice job of, of keeping us along the shore of the island, though, where the waves weren't as bad, and did that for a good portion of the ride back. Uh, and then that way we could avoid the worst of it. But we did, we got to a point where there was no avoiding it. We had to cross the channel, and, uh, and, and the, the, that was as far as we could go. Um, at this point, the two boats had gotten separated because they go at slightly different speeds with different numbers of people on them. And, uh, and we waited for, for the second boat to catch up before crossing the channel. And that's when I got the indication that the channel is going to be worse than what we're thinking it's going to be. Um, 
And so, and, and also at that same time, one of the crew members was like, I know you're fine up there now, but you really want to go under when we go across the channel. And so at that point, I, I ducked under, underneath the tarp and, uh, and, and rode out the rest, the, west, the rest of the way from there. Um, and actually, I was glad I did at that point, because as soon as we started crossing the channel, uh, it was just really intense. Um, the the waves were so much higher, and you would go uh, basically underneath the tarp. Uh, we wouldn't be able to see forward, um, but I was near the back of the tarp, so I could uh, peek out and see the the other boat that was with us out out uh, out, out the the back of the boat. Um, but the whole time, basically, you'd hit the, hit a wave, and and you'd feel yourself go airborne, and he knew it was only a matter of time before you came crashing back down. And it was always like you j you had nothing to do but but wait for the impact. And man, was it a, a bone-shattering impact. I mean, it, every single hit, uh, we were sitting just like on a plywood floor of the boat, and it was just jarring. Uh, one was such a big uh, hit that that David, one of the the others I was with, uh, he when he, we came back down, he went straight through the plywood, and and it was just incredible. I, we were lucky there was another layer of boat underneath that; otherwise, we would have been in trouble. Uh, but but it was just such an intense uh, passage, and it and fortunately most of our our uh, of the journey had already taken place. But we were still out in the channel for uh, for what felt like forever. It was in reality, it was about a half an hour. Um, but finally, we passed across and we got to uh, got to shore, eased up a lot, and we were able to get out of boats no problem. Um, and at that point, it was just kind of uh, downhill from there. You know, we were just uh, went back in the cars. We had an, another hour hour and a half long journey on the way back there. And by the time we got back to, to where we were staying, it was probably 3.30 in the afternoon. So overall, I mean, part, they always say it's, it's, it's the journey, not necessarily the destination. Um, but in this instance, it really was both. I mean, the, the journey was so intense even getting there, but then the destination was, was amazing as well. And, and so it really, uh, it, it, that whole combination made for, for an amazing day. I'm not sure why I really wanted to share this story. I, I, I think part of it is I just, I wanted to remember it for me and I wanted to be able to, um, I mean, of course I'll always remember it, but, but now the details are more fresh in my mind and I'm able to, to remember the, these, the details that I want to continue remembering as in the years to come. But I also wanted to tell the story just because I thought it was important an important story to tell. Um, anyone in this world will have... Uh, you can find people in this world that are completely different than, than you are. And that doesn't matter where you came from, where you grew up. Uh, there's always somebody out there that's, that's different from you. Um, but there's much more in common... We have a lot more in common than you would necessarily think. And, and that's kind of what I took home from all this, is that really, even though there, we grew up in very different environments and we have very different cultures um, and, and just it, there's so, there couldn't be anything, uh, I mean, we couldn't be farther apart as, as in, in those respects. But what brought us together is that we all had the similar interests, you know, like we all had love for our families, we all cared about our friends, we all wanted human connection, we all had hopes and dreams and goals, and we valued our health, and it's, and those are the things that no matter who you are, you have those values and you can find people with those values no matter where you go. doesn't matter if you have to take a plane and a car and a boat and and go outside a cell phone range and go to an island somewhere in the middle of the Pacific. You'll still find people with these same values. And so that's why I wanted to tell the story. 
thanks a lot for watching this video. Um, thank you for hearing me out and I really appreciate everyone who, who takes the time to watch this. Take care.